So good afternoon and welcome to the Culinary Arts Career Pathway panel. I'm really excited that you all have joined us today, both virtually and in person in our Career Center for this amazing and informative session about the ever-changing and fast-paced and exciting field of culinary arts. My name is Christina McGuire, and I am the Internship Coordinator in the Career Center, and I'm also joined by Val Yerman, who is here live and will be helping us with the Q&A at the very end. So before we begin our panel, I would like to hand it over to Chef Stefan Rob to speak a little bit more about our culinary program. Thank you, Christina. Okay, my name is Stefan Rapp and I'm a faculty teaching at School of Culinary Art at SBTC. We have changed our program, it used to be a two-year program, and now uh, we transit somehow. We're not offering as many classes, but the classes we offer are really uh, focused on cooking, definitely on cooking. So we are offering now two certificates, which can be obtained within two semesters. The total of is about uh, 30 units, 35 units of, um, of uh, cooking. Uh, some classes, of course, are going to be lectures and is really big emphasis on cooking. And we also offering uh, hotel management classes. That's a part of our program too, with a different, uh, they're pretty much online classes only. And we're very fortunate uh, to have had a, a brand new kitchen installed. So it's really state of the art. You don't need to go to, you know, the prestigious school like uh, the CIA to get into a terrific, terrific environment. And we have some students here with us. Um, I saw Fafana who can tell you how great the kitchen is in case you need to get more information. Voila. Thank you, Chef. I really appreciate that. So we're going to begin um, just with some brief introductions. We have some amazing panelists that will be sharing their knowledge and journeys in the culinary field. I'm going to introduce everyone, do some panel questions, then open it up to some Q&A at the very end. For those joining us virtually, feel free to put your questions in the chat box. And then students in person, we'll be answering those um, at the very end as well. So to begin, we're gonna start with Chef Paul Osborne. Chef Paul is a Santa Barbara native and resort chef at Rosewood Miramar Beach Hotel. He attended SBCC School of Culinary Arts from 2007 to 2009, and then had the pleasure of working in many kitchens in Santa Barbara and Portland, Oregon, before settling in Ventura with his wife and joining the opening team at Rosewood Miramar Beach. So welcome, Paul. Thank you. Happy to be here. Awesome. All right. So next we have Chef Michelle Osborne. She's the executive chef at Seasons Catering. So Michelle's first job out of culinary school was with Seasons Catering Inc. back in 2009. After about two years, she moved on to go work in restaurants and eventually moved up to Portland, Oregon with her now husband. While there, she learned about Japanese cooking and was able to broaden her knowledge of the culinary world. She and her husband, who is also a chef, joined today with us, decided to move back home to Ventura, where she was able to once again work for Seasons Catering. Welcome, Chef Michelle. Oh, thank you for having me. So thank you for joining. All right, last but not least, we have Chef Nancy Weiss, consulting chef, child nutrition advocate, and former director of food services for the Santa Barbara Unified School District. After graduating from UCSB with a degree in English, Nancy went on to open Soho Restaurant and Music Club in the mid-1980s in Santa Barbara. In 2008, Nancy took over as Director of Food Services for the Santa Barbara School District. There, she revolutionized food service for her students to an incredibly high standard. Weiss's reinvention of campus dining challenges the entire school food model and continues to make SB Unified an example for forward-thinking school districts throughout the nation. Nancy is the recipient of the 2018 Santa Barbara Independent Local Hero Award, the Spirit of Service Award, and the Golden Carrot Award from the, from the Physicians Committee for Responsible Medicine, and the 2017 Congressional Women of the Year Award. Welcome, Chef Nancy. Thank you. Thanks for having me. 
Thank you all. For, yeah, thank you all so much for being here. Welcome. We really appreciate it. Um, so with that being said, we're going to start our questions. The first one is, you know, I've already introduced you all, but I would love to hear in your own words what you currently do. And if you could provide a brief synopsis of your career and educational path thus far. So Chef Nancy, would you like to begin? Well, thank you. Thanks for having me. Hi, everybody. Um, I started long ago cooking in my parents' kitchen. My mother was not a very good cook. And so I took over the kitchen at a very young age and never looked back. I went to college up here in Santa Barbara, um, thinking that I was going to do something completely different. But the passion for the kitchen kept coming back to me over and over. And so I became very involved with um, the culinary industry after I graduated from UCSB and took a small job at uh, a restaurant and nightclub on State Street um, named Zello and uh, started cooking there as a sous chef and then quickly made my way toward the executive chef position. Um, in fact, Stefan, Chef Rapp and I worked together on and off through the years in various forms. And that was um, our first time together in the kitchen was there at Zella restaurant. After that, I um, went on to open my own restaurant. Um, I jumped right in feet first, head first, heart first. Should have probably given myself a little more um, education in the, uh, the restaurant industry before jumping in, um, but I did nonetheless. And I think the only thing that really saved me was my passion for the kitchen again. So the food was, was uh, the backbone of the restaurant and it made for a very, very successful run. So, uh, Soho is still in business today. Uh, though, as Christina said, I uh, let go of the restaurant and one thing led me to another and I started with Santa Barbara Unified um, and loved that too because it was a completely different experience. It had to do with feeding kids and um, I took all of that knowledge from the restaurant and poured it into a school district. Um, whose food service department was still serving chicken nuggets and a lot of processed food. And I took my experience as a chef um, and fast forwarded into our school menus. Um, I retired a couple years ago and um, am now consulting uh, in, in the food service industry. And it's interesting to see the gamut of different opportunities there are for me and the interests that um, exist um, in the culinary industry still for me after putting both of those careers away. I'm uh, now consulting with um, a prestigious tennis academy in Ojai I've done their food service um, uh, program for a couple years now, turned it around from also being very processed to being very fresh and whole. Um, and I'm also working with the United Boys and Girls Club, uh, developing their kitchen so that we can feed after school kids. Um, and then I'm working with the Good Samaritan Homeless Shelters, developing kitchens so that we can feed homeless people. And also a culinary program hinged on that so that the people that are in these shelters can actually learn a trade, a viable, wonderful trade um, that served me well for the last 40 years, believe it or not. So uh, my passion is still in the kitchen after all these years. And uh, I applaud you students for uh, taking a dive and seeing what the beautiful, magical world of cuisine has to offer you. Thank you so much, Chef Nancy. And I love that you mentioned the word passion a few times, because I think that's so key for this field. So I appreciate it. Um, Chef Michelle, same question. If you can give us a brief synopsis of your career and educational path thus far. 
All right. Well, I went to the culinary, the city college program back in 2010. And I wasn't really sure I was at city college. I wasn't really sure what I wanted to do. I've just always enjoyed cooking my whole life. And I had some friends that were doing it. So I decided to try it out and have kind of stuck with that's been my career path ever since I kind of fell into it and completely fell in love with it. And um, we ended up moving up to Portland, Oregon after a couple of years and what worked up there in a Japanese restaurant and did we made ramen from scratch made the noodles from scratch it was like izakaya charcoal cooking uh so that really kind of broadened my horizon of different kind of cuisines and definitely fell more in love with the more asian styles of cooking and then when we moved back to ventura uh i got the job back with the seasons catering company and was quickly promoted up to executive chef there and now i've kind of been able to pick uh make the menus and make more of the food that I want to make as opposed to being told what to make. <laughs> um, yeah, and I'm still, I love learning new things. I love working with new people. It's great having a husband who is also in the same field because we both know the stress and all the highs and lows of the business. So to be able to have that support all the time is great. Yeah, that's about it for now. <laughs> Thank you so much, Michelle. Um, I also love hearing from alumni. So it's so cool. Um, and speaking of your husband, Chef Paul, would you like to, same question, give us a brief synopsis of your educational and career journey so far? Sure. Um, yeah, I I lived in France when I was 12 and, you know, for a year with my family. And, and uh, at that point, I read the book Kitchen Confidential by Anthony Bourdain. And I decided at age 12, I want to be a chef. And I've really never focused on anything else, which uh, some said was foolish at the time, you know, stay in school, go to college, you know, get your PhD. My whole family is all has their doctorates. They're all in education. They said, stay in school, get your PhD. You can always, you know, have cooking be a, a side passion, a passion project. But it's really all I've, I've ever focused on, ever wanted to do was be a chef. So uh, come high school, I enrolled in the, the R occupational program uh, for culinary at Dos Pueblos High School. Um, and then I toured a few big name universities, Johnson & Wales and um, Culinary Institute of America. And it just didn't make sense to me to, to spend $40,000 a year to learn how to make $25,000 a year um, and come out of school with you know all of that, that student loan debt and such. Uh, so I opted for Santa Barbara City College and I paid $800 for my entire culinary education. Um, and while I was working there throughout high school, I worked at UCSB actually in the dining commons as a you know summer job, and then it became a full time job. Um, and then in culinary school, and after I worked for six years at a catering company, uh, Village Modern Foods, um, and a few restaurants in Santa Barbara as well. Um, and that really kind of broadened my horizons to to all different types of cuisines. You know, I've always I've always loved French and Italian cooking, and all you know the the kind of technique and history that goes into it, but working for a catering company that is, it, it was great because, you know, one event would be an Indian menu, one event would be, you know, a Chinese menu, we would do a Persian wedding and, and do, you know, you'd have to research and, and make these dishes and sometimes make them with a family member. And, and so that that type of cooking really excited me, um, just broadening my horizons as such. So then, as Michelle mentioned, we moved to Portland kind of seeking uh, a bigger restaurant city, bigger restaurant scene. Um, and I too fell into uh, working for a sushi restaurant actually up there, Bamboo Sushi, for four years. Worked my way up to Chef de Cuisine um, in that restaurant group and opened four restaurants for them. So I was the chef that was going and opening the new stores. We opened a poke bar, we opened an izakaya, and then we opened three, three sushi restaurants in Portland. Um, but eventually started craving sunshine, which is hard to come by in Portland. <laughs> So uh, we moved back down here 2016 and I took an executive chef role at a private restaurant, um, a Belizean restaurant actually. Um, and I kind of, I don't know, I felt like at that point I wasn't ready to be executive chef. So, and I really wanted to, to be able to broaden my horizons still and, and work my way up in, in another sort of facet of this industry. So I got into hotels. Um, I was on the opening team uh, at the Hotel Californian. Uh, as a chef de cuisine at Blackbird restaurant there, um, worked my way up to executive sous chef there, 
and then went on to open Rosewood Miramar, which is where I am now. Um, so I opened that as chef de cuisine of the fine dining restaurant Caruso's um, and have since been promoted to resort chef. So now I run all of the, the day-to-day operations uh, for the hotel. Um, I have a culinary director ahead of me who's more like the creative mind behind everything. Um, but I run the operation with 92 people under me. So it's a very, very stressful, very you know high touch environment. I mean, we have five restaurants, two fine dining restaurants, one of which is pushing for a Michelin star. Um, and fingers crossed, we'll know December 5th. Um, and we have a huge banquets and catering program um, on site. Uh, you know, this month we have three buyouts and Thanksgiving we'll be doing about 1500 meals um, between all the restaurants and, and our grand ballroom. So it's a big operation and it, it's a lot of fun because it, like I said, you know, we have a Japanese restaurant, so I'm able to jump in there and, and you know, I'm passionate about Japanese cuisine and talk to those chefs and they inspire me and I inspire them. We can bounce ideas off each other, but then I can go into Caruso's our Italian restaurant and, and do the same. So there's really, there's so much opportunity to learn so many different cuisines and so many different techniques and, and meet so many different people. I mean, our team is so diverse. We have a chef de cuisine from India. We have a chef de cuisine from Mexico. We have two Japanese chef de cuisines. We have our whole pastry team is French, of course. Um, so it, it's just, I, I love the hotel industry and the, the opportunities it's, it's given me. Thank you so much. I love hearing about all of your diverse um, just experience, all three of you in, in this culinary field. So I, I really appreciate you know hearing from the professionals now. Um, so our next question kind of plays on that, but what do you like or maybe not like about the work that you do now? And if you've had multiple jobs, which do job did you like the best and why? And I'll start with uh, Chef Paul since you you just ended. What do I like not like? Uh, okay, um, I think I mean the thing that I don't like the most is now that I'm you know in a, such a high managerial role, uh, my kitchen time is precious. You know, it, it's sometimes it's an hour or two a day where I'm actually in the kitchen cooking. You know, the other day I have to carve out my time to to where I can actually be in there with the team because my my passion is always cooking. You know, I've never been hired because on paper I'm a good manager I've been hired because I do a tasting and they like my food um, I've never been promoted because you know I ran x y and z numbers I've been promoted because I can make a good plate of food we're only as good as our last dish and so I really sometimes miss you know being in the kitchen more but at the end of the day too you know as as we age and progress you know being on the line 10 12 14 hours a day it gets harder and harder so you know it's important also to to kind of eventually be able to step out of the kitchen and more into that managerial role. Um, what was the rest of the question? I'm sorry. Yeah, if there's a, a specific job that you might have really enjoyed, um, could have been in Oregon or wherever you were at. I think I, I really did enjoy working for Bamboo Sushi and just being, you know, able to, to open new restaurants and, and build new teams, you know, interview so many different people, find out who will work well together, who won't work well together, what drives people, what inspires people. And, and um, you know, being in a city like that too, that's uh, so restaurant focused, um, you're able to talk shop with, with a lot of people. People understand restaurants, they understand restaurant culture. Um, and it's, you know, an acceptable career choice to be a line cook in Portland. And you can actually pay your bills on a line cook salary in Portland, <laughs> you know, right in the park minute and so on and so forth. So you know, a lot of people there don't work two jobs, they work one job and they're very passionate about it. Um, you know, you go to bars and restaurants after work and it's full of industry people and you can talk about shop, talk about, you know, what inspires you. So, so that experience in Portland, I think was very formative um, and is one of the reasons for, for our, mine and Michelle's success today was being able to really just surround ourselves with, with this industry day in and day out. The people you hang out with on your days off are, are still chefs and cooks and dishwashers and, and you know, people you go camping with or go fishing with or go you know enjoy nature with you're still talking about food and it, it, like it never it, it just kind of meshes into your life awesome thank you chef paul chef michelle same question what do you like or not like about the work that you do and if there's any job that you really love the most or it could be the current job um yeah definitely what paul was saying is that i miss being in the kitchen and so now having that executive role is 
I'm at my desk most of the day and it's all just kind of emails and orders and meetings. So it is the precious time in the kitchen is definitely my favorite part of it, but it is also nice to have, to be able to step away and still see the kitchen run so smoothly and not have to be in there. But that would definitely be the fav my favorite part about it. Um, as far as my favorite job, I really do enjoy the job I have right now. I love working in Portland with kind of that whole restaurant scene and all the people up there, but I like the hours of catering a little more. It's more of like daytime, like a typical nine to five type job, not until I have more evenings off, sometimes kind of depending weekends and stuff. It's not as typical with the restaurants where you're working late hours. And I know on the other side of it, Paul definitely has the longer hours there, but um, I, I like, it's more sustainable for like being home and seeing family and that kind of thing. Um, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> that's no, that's great. And I love your perspective from the catering side of that. You mentioned the flexibility of that, that aspect. I think that's really important to, to share as well. So thank you. Um, and then Chef Nancy, same question. So what do you like or not like about the work that you do? And what was one of your favorite jobs? So uh, <clears throat> having the restaurant was uh, awesome, but it was also a love-hate because uh, having your own restaurant means you're there 18, 20 hours a day, uh, often sleeping on the floor of your office because you have to get up in the morning and you're closing because you have a liquor license and, and you're doing live music and, and you close at 2.30 or 3 o'clock in the morning. So uh, there was a lot to that type of lifestyle that was very um, stressful and, um, and, and difficult. Also difficult to get away and have a an, uh, quote unquote normal lifestyle. Um, when you have your very own place, uh, you are 110% committed to that place because your life and your livelihood depends on it. But um, more importantly, so do the lives and livelihoods of all your employees. And um, I had a lot of employees through the years of operating Soho. And then uh, fast forward to the um, director position at the school district. Uh, it was it's a very <clears throat> regimented uh, requirement oriented business because you're operating um, under a government agency. The Santa Barbara uh, City School District is a state and federally funded uh, food service program. And there are a lot of requirements and there are a lot, uh, there's a lot of red tape that um, slowed me up. So uh, it also tied my hands when it came to wanting to do certain types of food like vegetarian food or even vegan food, kind of try to clean up the, the menu a little bit. Um, so I was always hitting uh, roadblocks. Uh, but again, what I loved most about that job was trying to figure out a way around the roadblocks. So uh, using my creative mind and, um, and my passion again for wanting to feed kids whole and healthy food, I, I did figure out ways of making that change on a menu. So um, there's a lot to love and there's a lot that, you know, holds you back a lot of the time, but that's, that is the nature of life and nothing is a smooth sail. In the culinary industry, you just need to be uh, quick thinking because you're using live ingredients and you're feeding live people, um, which is what I love most about the, the industry. It's very vital. Thank you so much, Chef Nancy. Um, I'm also going to ask you the next question as well. Um, but I know that you have such a rich experience in the field, but could you describe a typical workday at maybe one of your, your positions that you've held? And what was the most challenging or satisfying part of that position? Uh, so as I said, the restaurant having your own restaurant means you're there pretty much all the time. Uh, having um, 
working with the school district after all those years in the restaurant, doing a nine to five job was like a, a very liberating, happy place for me in my life. I was older now. Uh, I wanted different things. And I would get up at five in the morning, exercise, get to work by 630. Kitchens were opening across the school districts. Uh, so you needed to be there kind of early, but your days were done by 2.30 or 3. Uh, and so that established a different kind of rhythm in my life that I didn't get to enjoy when I was operating the restaurant. Uh, but I would get up early and I would take care of myself, self-care, which is important in any industry, but certainly in the culinary industry, um, like Michelle and Paul know, you're on your, and now you probably, you're on your feet all the time, uh, you're, you're working all the time, or you're on your butt doing executive work now, right? Either way, self-care is the way to manage that so that you can have the, the, the vitality and the stamina that it takes to, you know, be in the culinary business. So um, my typical day was, my, I think, much preferred in the later career where I was getting up early and, uh, you know, getting to bed at 10 o'clock at night and not having to count a till and um, make sure that, you know, we had enough liquor for the next day in the restaurant, so. Thank you, Chef Nancy, and thanks for bringing up self-care. So important in this, any, any industry, but especially the culinary field, I feel. <laughs> so, Chef Michelle, same question. Could you describe a typical work day, and what do you find the most challenging or satisfying? Um, all right, typical work day is wake up in the morning, usually get to work around eight or nine, sit down, do emails, kind of work on schedule stuff, work on menus or proposals for new clients. Um, sometimes get to go in the kitchen, then just do orders, lots of more emails. <laughs> um, I think the most fun part of it is getting to put together the proposals and make the new menus for clients, especially when they have, when they kind of just let you pick the food you want to do. They don't really they they trust me as a chef and we that's more exciting than having someone come to the table and say this is exactly what I want you to make me <laughs> um as far as challenging situations I think after COVID this uh whole industry got a lot more challenging in terms of finding like with staffing finding people shortages on products so just kind of to dealing with all of that is a whole new spin and learning experience for this industry that I never could have imagined I would have to deal with. But um, it's, I don't know, it's learning new things every day with it, so it's good. Thank you, and I love always learning, right? I think that's so important too. Yeah. Um, Chef Paul, same question. Could you describe a typical work day at the Rosewood Miramar? And then what do you find the most challenging or satisfying? Yeah. Um... A typical workday for me, usually I start around 10 o'clock in the morning, unless we have a, a big breakfast, in which case I'll go in. If there's a big banquet breakfast, over 200 people, usually I like to show face. So I'll show up around five or six. But normally, yeah, and show up to the hotel around 10. Um, and I make a point of greeting every single person, every single restaurant as soon as I arrive, just so people know, you know, if there's an issue, if there's something going on, if they need something from me, I'm available to them. Um, having that many cooks and, and, people, chefs, stewards, dishwashers on my team, it's, you know, it's important for them to know I'm available to them, even though I'm not going to be by their side all day long, um, doing their job with them. Um, and just kind of, it gives me a sense for, you know, how the kitchens are organized. If people are stressed and running around and the place is dirty, then I know that maybe there's an issue that needs to be addressed that someone isn't talking about. Um, you know, generally, as soon as I walk in, people say, hey, good morning. Hey, we need avocados. We need this. Something hasn't arrived. Something, you know, I, I get a lot of information uh, just from that. And I'll usually put, poke my head in every walk-in cooler, kind of make sure, you know, the product is organized, the fish is where the fish is supposed to be, the parsley is where the parsley is supposed to be. Um, you know, our, our friends in Santa Barbara Public Health uh, like to visit us frequently because we have so many different restaurants and they all have their own operating permit. So we like to stay ahead of that game um, and be ready, make sure there's sandy buckets on the floor. You know, these are little things that if you don't ask people about every day and, and to make it a habit, they're easily forgotten. Uh, generally, 
around noon, uh, the chef de cuisines of the, the fine dining restaurants, the nighttime chefs show up. Uh, so noon to one is ordering time. Um, so generally they give me all of their orders and then I kind of uh, streamline everything uh, in order for the hotel. I do most of the purchasing um, for, well, I do all of the protein, all of the fish, all of the dry goods purchasing. And then I have one sous chef who does all the produce. So it's a lot and it's kind of, you know, especially in this, like Michelle mentioned, in this uh, post-COVID era, uh, there are a lot of supply chain shortages. Um, there are a lot of issues with, you know, whether it's the price of diesel and, and trucks just aren't, aren't coming as often as they used to, or um, people aren't fishing for certain fish anymore, um, you know, because it's not as profitable. It, all, all of these things, you know, uh, um, beef, for example, is just through the roof right now. It just keeps going up. Oil, too, because of the war in Ukraine. So it's like every, you know, I look and decide who am I going to give my fry oil business to this week? You know, can I give it to U.S. Foods? Can I give it to Chef's Warehouse? Five dollars cheaper on a box of oil, uh, compounded with the thirty boxes a week that I use to to fill all the fryers on property. It actually, you know, makes a difference. So, and then you know, I have a very close relationship with the Santa Barbara Fish Market um, that I've built over the years, so I can generally I'll text them, "Hey, do you have this and this and this for me?" Oh, like this morning, I'm, I need a bluefin tuna. They're out of bluefin tuna. So they're, they're texting me, well, we have ahi tuna. Well, I told them, can you pick the reddest loin of all the tuna you have um, and send it to me? Yes, we can. So, you know, that's, that relationship is good because uh, they make me look good and they make the food look good uh, once, you know, once I have this relationship with my vendors. Um, and then in the afternoon, generally, I'm oh, sorry, I'm getting... Can you hear me? <laughs> yeah, sorry. Uh, so generally uh, after that, put in orders till about three o'clock. Uh, that's when you just sit down and enjoy lunch um, and then go check in with the restaurants, go check in with the fine dining restaurants, um, try to sit in for pre-shift in each of the restaurants, um, you know, around five, 5.30, uh, make sure there's no call outs, make sure everyone showed up for work. Uh, if someone didn't find a way to, to fill that spot, um, you know, and then you know, for the next hour or two, usually I'll hang out in the fine dining restaurant or the private club uh, with the chef, just kind of like spitballing ideas. Like, what are we going to get at farmer's market this weekend? Because we go every every Saturday to the farmer's market and load up. And, and it, it's very inspiring to go because, again, we, we finally built this relationship with these vendors there. So we have this guy that has um, Macrute limes and he hides all the good ones for us. So, you know, and as soon as they come into season, they know we want those because we use them on a dish every year. Um, but talking about, oh, I, I saw persimmons last week, they're in, but they're not that good yet. Should we put them on the menu? You know, should we not? Once you see something at the market, you know, it's truly at its peak of season. So, you know, we can, we can put it on a menu and then know that it'll last a, a bit longer and cooking like that with seasonality is actually, uh, it's cheaper too. You know, green beans when they're in season are half the price of green beans flown in from Chile in the off season. I mean, it, it, it just makes sense. No one should be serving stone fruit right now. It, it's, you know, it's from the Southern hemisphere. It's not gonna be as good. Um, so yeah, generally the next few hours is spent in the fine dining restaurant or we have a big banquet event. I mean, pretty much every Saturday night we have a wedding. Um, so I'll, I'll be on that side of things in the banquet operation, helping out the banquet team, all hands on deck, you know, for plate up. Uh, generally, you know, cut out around 8 p.m. Uh, so it's not, you know, it's not as rough of a day as, as you know, Nancy described in the restaurant industry. I mean, I, I remember early in my career, you know, you worked until midnight, one in the morning, uh, and then you got to go back again, you know, eight or nine, or if someone called out at 6 a.m., you know, it, the hours are, are very long. But once you kind of, once the team is stable, it, it really, and you can lean on each other, it, you really don't need to put in that many hours. Thank you so much, Chef Paul. And I think um, when you mentioned the first thing that you do is greet everyone when you go in, and I think that's a really great character trait. So that kind of segues to the, the next question, really. Um, our students are going to be out looking for jobs, internships um, pretty soon. And what character traits are important to have in the work that you do? Should I, should I go first? <laughs> um, character trait, I mean, teachability is, is the most important thing um, to remain open and teachable um, and receptive. Um, 
you know, when I was younger in my career and one chef showed me how to do thing one way and then I'd go to another restaurant and say, no, this, is, this isn't how we used to do it at the last restaurant. Well, too bad, you're not at the last restaurant. I'm the chef now at this restaurant, you do it my way. Um, and, you know, and I realized now how annoying that would have sounded coming from me uh, to my chefs at the time because there are so many different ways to, to get to an end result. Um, I had chefs early in my career that would give me a, a dish and it would take six pans to pick up one dish on saute. And it was my job to figure out how to make that dish with two pans and do a hundred of them on a Friday night and, and uh, still put that same plate of food in the window that he'd shown me uh, with the six pans. Um, but yeah, te teachability, openness, willingness to learn, you know, everyone comes in at a different skill level. Um, but as long as, you know, you're open and you want it and you want to learn and, and grow and, and be passionate, you know, that this industry can't just be a job. It's, it's a lifestyle. It's a career. Um, there are many jobs that will pay the same as this will entry level that are much easier. Um, but if, if you're passionate about it, it, it really doesn't feel like work. It becomes this whole new, like, like family you surround yourself with. Uh, so that, that's what I'm always looking for in people, you know, when I interview them is just a, a willingness and a, and a passion and, you know, receptiveness. We can teach our way of doing things. We can teach the, the skills. But if you're not open to, to learning and receiving that information, then, then it's hard to work with someone. Thank you. Teachability is huge and passion again, that, that key word right there. Um, same question, Michelle. What are some character traits that are important to have in the work that you do? I personally look for people like you have to have a good work ethic. And I think it comes pretty quickly when hiring people. You're, if you tell pretty early on if they're going to be a team player or going to kind of go their own way. And that is that does not work in this industry at all. So there'll be days where, yeah, like the dishwasher calls out and I'm going to jump in and I'm going to start washing dishes. Like you really have to be willing to do anything, even if that's not. You can't just be like, oh, that's not in my job description. I'm not going to do that. Like you need to, if one person is falling behind, you have to be able to have a team that's going to pick up where the other people are uh, slacking off. And hopefully you don't have anyone on your team like that. So everyone has a good work ethic. Sense of urgency is huge too. Um, there's not, there's no time for kind of the slow, I mean, slow kind of lackadaisical to, type of work really. So you have to, yeah, work ethic and sense of urgency. <laughs> yes, work ethics, huge. Um, same question, Chef Nancy, what are some character traits that you feel are important in, in this field? It's hard to add to that because that is pretty much it. You need to be passionate and dependable, which is the work ethic. And without a strong work ethic, without being able to make it to work on time and be there and available and open-minded to learn what it is uh, that you don't know without an attitude of, uh, I know it all. Um, so yeah, I can't add more than just have a, a strong, healthy work ethic and approach your work like, uh, like you mean it, like you care. Love it. Um, all right, the next question, I think we've touched on it a little bit, but how much education do you need for the work that you do as compared to just hands-on experience or are they both equally as important? And Chef Nancy, if you wanna go first. No, um, I have a degree that, that, um, that gave me uh, a, a certain maybe respect for education, but the actual uh, work that I've done in both the restaurant and in school food, uh, I relied very little on my, my degree and more on um, the school of, of hard knocks, the experience that, I've, that I had over the years um, of uh, you know, different working with different people, working with different menus, working with um, um, and in the two separate industries. I really, um, yeah. 
Thank that's you. Good. No, that's 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 solid. Uh, Chef Michelle, same same question. Um, I think the school part is great for learning the fundamentals, but definitely the work experience I think is way more important. So even like when hiring people, if I'm looking at the resume, I don't really care as much about where they went to school, if they went to CIA versus city college program, or I'm looking at like the places they've worked, how long they've worked somewhere, um, and yeah, what they did there. Okay, and then Chef Paul, same question. How much education do you need for the work that you do compared to hands-on experience? I think, I mean, it's it's a bit of both. I think culinary school definitely lays the foundation. Um, this, this I, There's still things that Chef Raph taught me and Chef Charlie taught me that I reference to this day. Um, you know, like the Salumi program we just implemented it was, it was Chris Scherzer was the TA in Chef Charlie's class when I was there in 2007. And he came in and, and retaught us this, the Salumi program the other day. Um, Chef, I still say it's tinfoil because of Chef Rap. Uh, why waste it, you know? Um, but I think, I think the connections you get in culinary school and learning are, are more important or as important as the learning, you know? The restaurant connections, meeting people in the industry, getting leads on jobs, doing the catering there at City College. We'll see how a catering event is run so that when you actually go work at a catering company, th these things make sense. The, these terms and these words, what's a, a chafer, what's a, you know, what's a can of pay, all of this stuff um, is important. I think on the job training is, is crucial. Um, I really like how Chef Rapp said that, you know, the program is more focused now on teaching people how to cook, which I think is so important because a lot of these culinary schools um, were focused for a long time on, on telling people that they went to culinary school, they come out and be the next executive chef. And that's just not the case. You still have to work your way up after school to that level. And if you come out and get a management position too early, it can actually you know, be detrimental. Yeah, thank, thank you for, for the answers on that one. It's it's definitely a balance, right? You need both, I believe, the technical and your, you know, hands-on experience. So um, you mentioned networking. So quick question. I think some of, you know, our students are going to be looking for jobs pretty quickly. Do you know of places hiring or is your is your establishment hiring right now? And that could be to any of the chefs. We are not hiring right now because we're kind of going into our slow season with, or like the next month or so, but definitely starting in January, we will be hiring. We just picked up a new contract to do all the food service for Pacifica Graduate Institute in Montecito. So that's kind of a whole, on top of all the catering gigs that are more seasonal, this is a full-time year round gig. So we will be hiring in January for that. That's awesome, congratulations. That's a great contract. Thank you. Um, we are currently hiring a few pastry positions. Uh, like Michelle said, you know, December in, in Santa Barbara tends to be a slower month um, outside of the holidays. And people don't generally change jobs uh, in December. You know, you have your holiday plans, you have your family plans. Um, but come January, people tend to kind of start looking. And, and you know, I think there will be more openings uh, in January. Um, thank you. Um, well, we're getting towards the end of our panel because I want to save some time for some Q&A with our students, but just a final wrap up question. Um, what advice do you have for students wanting to work in this field? Um, Chef Nancy, do you, would you like to start? Um, I think it's important to get as much experience as possible um, and as Chef Paul said, the foundation that's laid with Santa Barbara City College Culinary Program is instrumental in how you're going to fit into whatever um, job you, you find yourself in. So I think that it's important to get as much groundwork as possible. And again, you need to really be ready to put your heart and soul into learning um, and more learning so that you can be as 
um, helpful and supportive to your team as possible, because that is going to make or break any uh, restaurant or food service program that you decide to uh, become part of. You need to be part of a team. Thank you, Chef Nancy. Chef Michelle? That was, I was thinking the exact same thing. Just get as much experience as you can, like work, work in catering, work in restaurants, work at a breakfast place and the, like just all the different fields of it and kind of figure out, you can learn something from each job you have. So just gaining as much experience in actually working at places. Thank you. And then Chef Paul. Um, I think, I mean, this was told to me as well early in my career, and I think it's been good advice is just find the best chef who will take you um, and learn as much as you can from them. Um, don't, at the beginning of your career, don't be focused on money. The money comes. The money comes with the experience. Become the best cook you can be. Learn as much as you can. And it opens, you know, many doors. Like I said earlier, you're only judged by, by your last dish. Um, in this industry, uh, those of us who can who can cook and cook well uh, will always find work. Um, so I think laying down that foundation and, and working for someone, you know, if if you move down to LA, work for the you know one star, two star Michelin, work for the best chef who will take you and, and learn as much as possible, and it will open many many doors. And be willing to start in the dish room. Yes, yes. Yes, always you can work your way up, right? Yeah, yeah. Important. Okay, great. So thank you so much. That's it for our for our formal questions. So um, students joining virtually, um, if you have any questions for our panelists, please put those in the chat box. And then students in person, if you have any questions, I believe Val is on the floor and she can definitely unmute and ask those questions. We'll wait a few minutes. Well, I actually have a question. I don't think I, this is <laughs> just one, but what do you all do for self-care? Because this seems so busy. Are there certain things that you all do for self-care? Oh. <laughs> For me? <laughs> yeah, I'm curious uh, because you, yeah, fishes. your job I, overwhelms me. No, I, I'm, I'm obsessed with uh, sport fishing. <laughs> so oh, wow. <laughs> my, my other passion, um, yeah, on, on days off, generally, if weather allows, um, I mean, I, I, I love the ocean, I love anything, um, you know, fishing and, and beach and ocean related. Um, so go out to the islands, decompress, there's no cell phone reception out there. So it doesn't matter if someone tries to contact me, they can't. Um, outside of that, we love to go camping, uh, walk the dog, take the dog to the park in the morning before work, exercise, eat healthy. I can't stress that enough. Uh, there's so many fatty foods around all the time. And, and if, if you don't eat healthy and, and keep your, your mind right, um, the stress can be overwhelming. So it, it's very, very important to, to stay balanced and, and stay healthy. Otherwise, the, the job will overwhelm you. Anyone else or self-care? Yeah, I think just making the most of your days off and kind of having that healthy balance of enjoying your free time, but then still enjoying what you do while you're working all the time because most of most of all of our days are spent at work. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Great. We actually have a question in the chat box. Um, Eric is asking, have you ever felt frustrated or desperate in the field? And how do you deal with those emotions? All the time. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, frustration is common in this field, um, whether it be, you know, small things or, or, you know, with another person or with a vendor or with, uh, you know, the front of the house versus the back of the house is always this age old battle. Um, but I think, how to deal with that is to take a step back and look at the bigger picture. You know, look at the, the team as a whole. If you're mad at the server for doing this, try to empathize and understand what they're going through. 
they have the guest in front of them asking for something and, and re-asking them and blaming them if it's wrong, even if it's not their fault. So, so just, I guess, trying to, to see it through the other person's um, point of view, I think is very important. Um, you know, whether you're a server, a dishwasher, a chef, a cook, I mean, we're all in this industry together and we're <laughs> all in the same boat. And so I think it's important to, to remember that, um, you know, this field is has changed a lot in the past few years and there are less and less chefs especially specialty chefs like pastry chefs and sushi chefs who are kind of becoming a dying breed but that's also i think really helped us because i see wages going up i see chefs being taken seriously for the first time as a as a, a proper career choice and and, and a well-regarded career choice we're no longer just the help um but yeah i mean the field you know for many years was just <laughs> these hidden people in the kitchen that, uh, you know, no one talked to, they were just considered the help, but I think it's up to us to change that, that perception now. Oh, thank you. I, I actually, I think we have a question in person live. So Val, do you want to take it away? We have our live question. If you can get closer to the mic so we can hear you. Still, still can't hear Val. No, we can't hear. I'm getting a text message too. <laughs> mm. Maybe Val, could you put it in the chat box maybe so that we can definitely answer that question? Okay, she's chatting it right now. Um, I'm sure I'm not sure the question Val took a job cooking and doing dishes and the only cook in the cook one position to another. Kind of unsure. Okay, we'll go to another question, I think, for right now. So there was a question in the chat. Has your career shaped the person you are today? I would say completely. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, even just for Paul and I found each other, like our marriage from being working in this industry together. So on that simple level, yes, but also, and this is where 75% of our day is at our job. So it has a big impact on who I've become. How about you, Chef Nancy? I know you've, you've been in the field for, I think you said 40 years. Mm -hmm. uh, do you believe it shaped your, who you are today? Oh, definitely. From the different types of food that I've uh, found myself presenting to either the restaurant goer or the student on the salad bar um, to now at a tennis academy. But yeah, we, um, yeah. Great. And then another fantastic question. What books do you recommend to read or sites to view when looking for recipes and learning how to present for plate foods? Any chef could answer this one. <laughs> chef Steps, if you want to do any sous vide cookery, Chef Steps, the website is fantastic. Chef Steps. Um, yeah, I mean, if, if you're cooking anything sous vide, that they are so nerdy about how they, they go through and just categorize everything. You know, if you want this medium rare all the way to rare on lamb or beef or pork or chicken. Um, 
and books. I mean, like I said, Kitchen Confidential kind of gives you the rough, uh, you know, side of the industry um, and, and how it used to be, but it's a good book to read to see the real nitty gritty uh, by Anthony Bourdain. Um, I mean, and, you know, any of these, these, these three-star Michelin chefs have some really beautiful cookbooks. Most of the things <laughs> you can't really make at home or, or emulate very easily, myself included. I mean, but uh, they're just incredible to, to look through and get inspired. Thank you. Maybe um, the chefs can email me any fun books or resources that they love, and I can send that out to all participants, if that would be okay. That'd be kind of cool. Um, we do have the live question. I believe it was, how do you handle training issues when someone wants you to do something one way and another person wants you to do another way? It's a little bit frustrating. So how would you, how would you deal with that? if you're being trained differently from different chefs. I think it kind of goes with what Paul mentioned earlier, just being open to doing, to learning things different ways. So you're always gonna have chefs wanting something a particular way and you just need to be open to, they want you to cut it this way, even though at my last job, they wanted me to cut it that way. So it is frustrating, but it's gonna happen throughout your life all the time so you just have to be open to it i ran into this situation actually this week um you know two chefs in the same restaurant the sous chef and the executive chef were telling a cook to do something two different ways um but at the end of the day what i advised them to do was you know if the sous chef's telling you to do one way tell them to talk to the executive chef because you know, the, it's the executive chef's name on the restaurant. It's the executive chef's food that he's trying to impart in you. Um, and if this other person is is telling you to do it another way, encourage them to say, hey, chef, show me how to do it this way. This is how they want it. If not, ask, 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 ask. It's not, I mean, you know, ask, ask the executive chef, ask the sous chef, ask the other person who's, why are we doing it this way? But then at the end of the day, it's their decision. I think there was a, um, thank you both. There's an add on to the question. What if someone isn't asking you to do it according to serve safe policies? Well, I think you need to talk to the executive or the chain of command and go to the top if you're feeling like there's some sort of problem with the health and safety of the customer. Absolutely. Thank you, Chef Nancy. Um, all right, I think. Yes, that was the question. Let's see, any others? Can international students work in US restaurants? Depends on the visa. Yes, I was just gonna mention that too. We, we uh, like at the hotel, we have some J1 visas, uh, some O1 for managers and some uh, TN visa, which is like a management trainee, um, which, you can if you're on, on that visa, but I'm not, it depends on, on the country um, and the work permit specifically. Thank you, Chef Paul. And yeah, and I was just gonna add on to that, you know, if there's specific questions regarding that, that would be great to, you know, speak with one of us in the career center or in the international student office, they can give you a little bit more detail about, you know, work permit and what you're able to do um, legally uh, in terms of the restaurants. Uh, Another question in the chat box. How do you deal with the packaged foods for receptions? Hmm. What do you mean by that? I don't know yeah, if we, any of us do packaged foods. Yeah, Linda, could you elaborate a little bit more? You can feel free to un unmute yourself if you'd like. Yes, we have problems at all the art receptions. Um, at uh, churches and temples where we have a, a membership of, of church members, right? But if anybody comes in, uh, we, we've been told that we have to have packaged food. We cannot bring in home cooked food. Uh, so I have to say that this is pretty grisly when you have a, a, a nice art reception, they're pouring wine, and then they have to hand out packaged chips and things like that. Is there a way to get around that where where we're not in violation of the the health, you know, health department? If it's a private function, I don't 
think health, environmental health has uh, any jurisdiction if it's a private function. I don't know, Paul or Michelle, do you know? I mean, we, we have, uh, like in terms of outside food, we only allow someone to bring it into the resort if they sign a waiver. Um, that basically releases, like if someone wants, has a certain smoothie mix, they have to have, uh, and they want us to, you know, they want to bring these ingredients and have us make it for them. Uh, we make them sign a waiver that says that if, you know, if they get sick from this food that they brought in, uh, it's not on us. So I guess it depends on probably the health operating permit of, of uh, each venue. And at the end of the day, I think it's up to, um, you know, whomever, whomever is running that venue, whether it be a church or, or um, something else maybe they don't have a, a health permit i mean to me though it seems like it if it's like a potluck it shouldn't matter i know that in public school we needed to uh individually wrap items if we were going to be doing something uh for the public at large like a board meeting or something like that but um in terms of us and we catered as well through the the department food service department but when we did uh, private functions, like uh, at somebody's home or it was somebody's birthday, we didn't individually wrap things. So I, I can't imagine a, a bake sale at a church would have to be individually wrapped, but it does depend on the health permit. Um, thank you, Chess, for, for answering that. Um, I know we are at time. Um, would you all have time for two more questions that were in the chat box? Would that be okay? Yes. Okay, great. So um, one question, is there longevity once you are higher now? Is the industry a little bit more stable now as a field? Yes. I don't know if it's any more stable, but I think there's definitely, um, it's, we are more, desperate to hire people like there's just not as many people in the field so I think you have if you're really passionate about it you have a strong chance to have make a whole career out of it I think we're sorry Paul. I think we're stable until our next pandemic I mean <laughs> stable is you know, it's a relative term to be stable yes I think private restaurants are notoriously unstable, it's like smaller private restaurants, especially, I mean, Santa Barbara is such a high failure rate for restaurants because the margins are so slim and it's so expensive to operate a restaurant in Santa Barbara. So, you know, as a cooking job, if you get into the right restaurant and it's profitable and, and you know, and it has a good crew and everyone has each other's backs, there there can be a lot of longevity. Restaurants, Loquita, The Lark, you know, they've been in town for a long time, um, have had the same crew for a long time. Um, hotels and, and catering companies too, I think, are, are more stable places to be. Um, but yeah, I, you know, last year was really rough for everyone in this industry, just with the, the COVID curtain kind of coming off and, and two years of pent up uh, weddings and events and, and people not ready to go back to work. Um, so it was, you know, half the, half the staff doing double the work um, and it, it burned a lot of people out and a lot of people got out of the industry, but now we've stabilized. I've seen this year, we're doing a normal amount of events and a, a you know, pre COVID normal amount of, of business. And it seems like the crew now, at least that I've had for the last year, year and a half is, is very stable. No, no one's coming, no one's going. It, it's kind of, we've found our comfort zone. Um, and, you know, I can see some of these people being there 10, 15, 20 years, like some of the Four Seasons, Biltmore Four Seasons employees when they closed had been there 30 plus years. Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you. Um, last question for uh, the session. Do you have any tips when there are missing ingredients for a dish or how to fix a dish? Any tips or techniques in the kitchen that are useful to you? Any chef can go first. <laughs> That's where you use, you put on your, your creative chef cap and you go to town. You know, I don't, I don't, I, I think that a creative cook will always find an alternate ingredient, unless it's something that's going to completely kill the, kill the cake. I don't know. Paul? <laughs> uh, recipes are uh, guidelines, I, I say, not a, 
um, guidelines, especially at home. I mean, you know, if you ask yourself when you're eating what you cook, do you like how it tastes? Then great, you succeeded. You made the recipe correctly. Baking, uh, some pastry chefs <laughs> would cringe right now at me saying this. Baking is much more a science and you should follow the ratios and the recipes, especially with your leavening agent and your, your you know, flour and sugar and such. But, uh, you know, in, in the kitchen, yeah. I mean, at the end of the day, substitute with whatever you want if you think it tastes good. And if, if you don't, you learn and, and next time do it differently. Awesome. Well, I just want to wrap by, up by saying thank you to Chef Michelle, Chef Paul, Chef Nancy for sharing your journeys and your wisdom. And, you know, it, this is this is great information to have. And thank you all uh, students for being here virtually and in person. Um, we wish you luck in your culinary adventure and journey. And just know that the Career Center is here to assist with job search, internship search as well. So definitely come in and stop by and visit us. So thank you everyone again and have a great rest of your afternoon. Thank, thank you. you. Thank Bye. you. Bye everyone. Bye. Bye.